in welcoming her uh, here this evening. You're probably aware of many of her accomplishments and accol accolades. I just mentioned a few. She's an atmospheric scientist. She's a distinguished professor, professor and chair uh, at Texas Tech University. She's the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy. She was named in Christianity Today as one of 50 women to watch and Time 100 Most Influential People. And also she's the acclaimed author of this book, uh, Saving Us. Uh, I'd like to share three reflections on Catherine that kind of stand out for me. Her TED talk on climate change garnered 3.9 million views and is one of the most viewed of this topic, more than Al Gore, but not quite as much as Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Still outstanding, I encourage you if you haven't seen that. Uh, she was one of the first scientists to join the advisory board of Citizen Climate Lobby, and she's been helpful in keeping our organization grounded in the science as we advocate for climate policy. When she came to Utah in 2015, I happened to be fortunate to be uh, able to be involved in the organizing of that. She had 26 engagements in five days. At the end of this time, the organizers were, ex <clears throat> were excited, um, but we were pretty worn out. But Catherine was energetic and willing to do more if her time was up. How, how does she work with such incredible energy? I don't know, but I suspect part of her answer that she's a Christian who cares deeply about others. I look forward to her sharing her faith and her perspective as a climate scientist with us today. So please welcome Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you so much, Dave, for that introduction. Um, we are being joined by people online. So there's a little camera there. I'm saying hello to the people online. And it looks like we currently have 80 people with us online, as well as here. So I'm going to be sharing my, oh, you're actually seeing what's on my screen. Okay. I'm going to be sharing my screen. There we go. Oh, dear. There is something bad happening here. Let's try to go with this. Okay. How about that? All right. How does that look on Zoom? We got the thumbs up. We're ready to go. So what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be talking to you, but you're also going to be talking to me. And you can do this whether you're here in person or online. If you're online, you can do this too. It's in real time and you can take out your phone, but you have to make sure the ringer's off. <laughs> so go to P-O-L-L-E-V, polev.com slash Catherine. If you're having problems, it's probably because you didn't spell Catherine with two A's. There has to be two A's there. And it will ask you to, no need to enter your name, just anonymous is fine, just push skip. And when you get there, um, this is how you're gonna ask me questions at the end, but I'm gonna ask you a few questions to begin with. And we'll just start with some really easy questions. They're gonna get progressively harder as we go along. Here's the first question. I would just like to get to know you. So multiple choice. Um, would you call yourself, are you LDS? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Jewish? Are you from another faith? Or are you unaffiliated? We're missing a little you there that's not affiliated. There's actually a you there, unaffiliated. So just getting to know you, yes. Yes, I will flash the address up one more time. It's actually at the top there too, but it's hidden by the Zoom bar. Um, you know what? I wonder if I can close, can I close that? Hmm. I'm trying to hit the X, but my, I, it's not, oh dear. Polev.com, there we go, closing the X. Uh, there, now you can see at the top, P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash Catherine. All right. Anybody having problems, put up your hand and your neighbor will help you. <laughs> Nobody's admitting to problems. Okay, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, all right. So if you're online, you can answer too. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can answer. And it looks like we've got, okay, so it looks like about eight. Oh, the LDS is oh, holding steady around 80. Okay. Protestant is inching its way up. We've got other faith and we've got unaffiliated. All right. I think it's most people are on. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you another question. And it's this. Again, get me getting to know you. How many people here have, there we go, read or listened to Saving Us? 
the whole thing partway through, picked it up recently, planning too soon, or saving what? This is anonymous. I have no idea which one you're choosing, so you can be totally honest, okay? <laughs> I like that. There's people who are honest. That's excellent. That's the name of the book that I just wrote this past year, um, and it answers two of the most commonly asked questions I get, which is what gives you hope and how do you have conversations about climate change? So I'm going to be drawing from some of the main messages of that tonight. So after this, you won't have to answer E anymore. But now I want to ask you one more question, and this last question is the hardest question. You have to answer with one word, any word you want. But only one word. And it is this. Oops, here we go. When I say, just a second here, there we go. When I say climate change, or when you say climate change, I feel what? I need a word about how you feel when someone says climate change. Any word. Oh dear, these pop ups are really getting to me. The problem is, is that my mouse has disappeared. So I'm it's just important to me, that's around. for sure. Oops, I'll leave meeting there. Oh, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay. All right. You know what? You are not alone. I've asked this question of several hundred people over the last few months. And this is exactly the same answer that I see no matter who I'm speaking with, no matter where we are. Number one word is worried overwhelmed, anxious, concerned, frustrated, depressed, angry, impatient, yes, urgent, resolved, challenged, resigned. I like how there's discouraged and encouraged right beside each other there for a second. And no wonder, no wonder that we feel this way. Now, Hang on to this. Don't close your window because I'm going to ask you a question as we go along to make sure you're still with me. And at the end, you can ask me questions using the same tool. You're going to have to tell your word to the person beside you and get them to put it in for you. They're friendly. They'll do it. Yeah, see, they'll do it for you. All right. No wonder we feel this way because we're conducting an unprecedented experiment with our planet. Ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we figured out how to dig up massive amounts of coal back then and oil and gas today, we've been burning it. And as we burn it, it produces heat trapping gases. And as it produces those heat trapping gases, they're building up in the atmosphere and they're wrapping an extra blanket around our planet. And our planet is quite literally running a fever. Why is this so serious? It's because as far back as we can go, We've never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. We're truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. Who wouldn't be worried? And if we aren't worried, we should be. The latest IPCC reports came out this past year. IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Report number one came out in August. It was about the science of climate change. And it showed us that it is warming faster now than any time in the history of humans on this planet. That report was called, nicknamed the Code Red Report. Then in February, the second volume came out and it showed that climate change is affecting every part of this world, every sector of our economy, every part of our lives. I call that report the your house is on fire report. And then, just last week, the third volume came out, and the third volume is about what we need to do to fix it. I call that one the manual to the fire extinguisher. But it's just the manual. You can't force the fire extinguisher into people's hands. You can tell them why it's important. You can tell them here's how you use it, but we need to show people why we need it. And that's because climate change affects every aspect of our lives. It quite literally affects the food we eat. It affects the water that we drink. It affects the air that we breathe. It affects every aspect of our infrastructure. Every part of our civilization is built based on an assumption that we hardly ever think about, the assumption that the past is an accurate predictor of the future. But it isn't. 
because now climate is changing faster than any time in the history of humans on this planet. And the biggest way it's affecting us is not through global warming, but rather through global weirding. What do I mean by that? Well, wherever we live, it's as if we have a pair of natural weather dice. And we always have a chance of rolling a double six, a heat wave, a hurricane, a wildfire, a drought. Okay, not a hurricane if you live in Utah. I live in Texas. We in Texas, we get more billion dollar weather and climate disasters than any other state. In fact, I've actually tried to think about what you don't get if you live in Texas. And the only thing I can think of is the kind of flash floods you get when snowpack melts. That's the only thing you don't get in Texas, but you get them here, right? So we have these natural weather dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six naturally, but decade by decade, as the world gets warmer and warmer, it's loading the weather dice against us. It's as if it's sneaking in and taking one number and turning it into a six and taking another and turning it into a six and taking one and turning it into a seven. And all of a sudden we're saying, we just had three 500 year flood events in Houston, Texas in three years. We just had the 118 degree weather in Portland, Oregon. We just had so many wildfires that were so big that they turned the sky orange. How could that be? That's climate change loading the weather dice against us. It's taking naturally occurring droughts and making them more intense. It's taking heat waves that we've always had and making them more dangerous. It's taking wildfires, most of which are the result of accidental human ignition and causing them to burn more area. It's making our storms stronger and they're dumping more rain on us. We're seeing this not just here, but around the world. We're seeing it in Madagascar, where stronger drought is causing famine. We're seeing it up in British Columbia in Canada, where the town of Lytton in British Columbia last summer, they broke the all-time heat record for the whole country of Canada one day. They broke it again the next day. They smashed it the third day. And on the fourth day, a wildfire swept through and burned down most of the town. We're seeing changes so fast, it gives you whiplash. Back last October, one of the headlines on October 18, the headline was California records driest year in a century. And then in October 25, seven days later, California rain breaks records. We're seeing it in Germany. We're seeing it here in the US. And we're actually starting to put numbers on how much worse climate change made it. We can put numbers on it. Now, that's the latest state of the science. We're even seeing how it's exacerbating geopolitical conflicts. For example, the situation in Afghanistan, it's been pushed off the headlines a little bit, but it is dire. Climate change didn't cause that situation. Its, its roots go back decades and even centuries. But what is climate change doing? It's exacerbating the situation. Let me just read you a few highlights here. Parts of Afghanistan have warmed twice as much as the global average. Spring rains have declined, especially in farmland. Droughts are more frequent, including a punishing dry spell, the second in three years. It embodies a new type of crisis where the hazards of war collide with the hazards of climate change, creating a nightmarish feedback loop that punishes some of the world's most vulnerable people and destroys their ability to cope. And they said, you know, it'd be facile to attribute the conflict to climate change. It wasn't caused by climate change, but the effects of warming act as what the U.S. military calls a threat multiplier. In other words, it takes a problem we already have and it makes it worse. And down here, a hydrologist says the war has exacerbated climate change impacts because for the last 10 years, half the national budget goes to war. Now there's no government and the future is unclear. Our current situation today is completely hopeless. Well, what geopolitical conflict is in the news today? The war on Ukraine. And as the second volume of the IPCC report was being finalized by the authors, Svetlana Krakowska, who is a climate scientist from Ukraine, joined the Zoom call on the IPCC report. And this is what she said. She said, human-induced climate change and the war in Ukraine have the same roots, our dependence on fossil fuels. We will not surrender in Ukraine and we hope the world will not surrender in building a climate resilient future. Climate change touches every aspect of our lives, but it affects those who have done the least to contribute 
to it the most. The poorest 50% of people in the world are responsible for 7% of the heat trap and gas emissions. Yet they are bearing the brunt of the impacts. The richest 1% were responsible for 15%. The richest 10% are responsible for half the problem. Climate change affects us all, but it disproportionately affects women and children, especially in low-income countries. In Malawi, they outlawed child marriages five years ago. It was now illegal to marry under the age of 18. But in the last three years, they've seen child marriages ticking up. And when you ask why, it's because of the increased risk of drought and famine if parents can't feed their families and someone comes along offering to pay for a daughter it might be the choice between the whole family starving or allowing that daughter to be married off, sometimes at the age of eight or nine or 10. Indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by climate change. I live in Texas and I work with our South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center where we have a number of tribes in New, in New Mexico and Oklahoma who are partners with us. And the ones, especially in Oklahoma, they've already endured forced climate change when they were forcibly relocated to Oklahoma. And now climate is changing again. And then when you look at the impacts, like for example, when you get the big storms like we had in Texas a year ago in February, where you get these huge ice storms, you have a blackout across the whole state, which neighborhoods get their power back on first and which neighborhoods get the power back on last? Who has a generator they can afford to rely on? Who can afford to go stay in a hotel? Who has a nice insulated home without broken windows? There are deep inequities right here as well as on the other side of the world in terms of who's most impacted by climate change. And we could even put numbers on this too. Since the 1960s, climate change has already increased the economic gap between the richest and poorest peoples in the world by as much as 25%. Before COVID, the United Nations was worried that climate change would undo the last 50 years of development, global health and poverty reduction. Well, now with COVID, it's pushing many more into poverty. COVID and climate change are interacting with each other, exacerbating each other, making each other worse. Climate change affects us all, but it affects the poor and the marginalized the most, and that's not fair. So we need our science to tell us how we're affecting the world. We need our science to tell us why it matters. And we need our science to tell us what the impact of our choices will be. Because we are living in an era where we humans are the ones who are responsible for the future of our planet. But we need our values, which for many of us come from our faith to tell us what to do about it. The science can tell us it's us, it's real, it's serious. But what do we do? That comes from here, not here. So the reason that I became a climate scientist was because I'm a Christian. When I found out that it affects the poorest and the most marginalized people, that it's profoundly unfair, that it causes untold suffering already, I thought, how can I not do everything I can to help fix this? And what I believe is guided by my faith. And I believe for many of you, it is too. That was one of the reasons I was curious for you to tell me who you were. So for example, if you look at the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about how we as humans are to be stewards. What does a steward do? A steward takes care of, right? A steward protects, a steward makes sure that something flourishes. And a similar concept is given in Genesis. If you look at Genesis, it says, God said, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. And that's something that you learn about. I remember learning about that in Sunday school. But for some reason, I never really learned the second half of that verse. So that there's a reason for humans to be created in God's image in order to, and I'm putting in the Hebrew word here deliberately because it's often interpreted into different English words, in order to rada every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Now, what does that word mean? It was originally translated as dominion. It's since been translated as have responsibility over, but rather than translating it into English, let's just look at a different place where the same word is used. The same Hebrew word is used in a different place in Psalms where it's speaking about a ruler. And it says, may he also rata from sea to sea, to what? To extract every penny of value and just leave it a crumbling, you know, smoking ruin? No, it, it says to deliver the needy, the afflicted, 
him who has no helper, to have compassion on the poor and the needy and the lives of the needy he will save. Connect this to what we were just talking about with climate change. So whatever English word you want to use for that word, what are you supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be caring for, protecting, looking after plants, animals, and humans. We're all living things, all of us. We're not somehow separate from nature. We can't float around in outer space without the resources this planet provides. And so that's why it isn't about saving the planet. The planet itself, this ball of rock that we sit on, will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is about saving us, us living things here on this planet. The living things that we have responsibility over, we believe. And I should point out that this is not unique to Christian religions. If you look at every major world religion, there are tenets of stewardship. There are tenets of caring for nature. There are definitely tenets of caring for those who are less fortunate than us. And if you really talk to anyone, and actually in my book, one of my favorite stories is um, a colleague of mine wanted to meet with me at a scientific meeting. And normally when somebody wants to meet, you have science to talk about, right? And so I didn't know what he wanted to talk about with me. So, so I remember going in and sitting down and before I'd even you know, touched the seat, he leaned across the table to me. He said, I'm a humanist, but I care about climate change too. I said, well, of course, I mean, you're a scientist. You've dedicated your life to this. He said, I care about it because it's not fair because it affects the poorest and most marginalized people. And that's why I've dedicated my life to this. So it really is a human reason to care because all of us live here on this planet together. And it isn't only about the, the caring, the stewardship or the caring for nature or creation. We are told, for example, Jesus says in the Bible that you should be recognized by your love for others. Imagine if everyone who said they believed the Bible was recognized by their love for other people, and that was the number one way they were recognized. I feel like we live in a very different world if that were the case. And of course, you have the same thing in the Book of Mormon. Teach us, teach them to love another and to serve each other. And again, what is climate action other than an opportunity to love and to serve? And so that's why I've, I've really become convinced that our failure to act on climate is really a failure to love. It's a failure to consider others above ourselves. It's a failure to honor the responsibilities we've been given. It's a failure to look at other people's needs and to say, what can we do to help? So I noticed over the years, I was starting to be asked the same two questions. And it got to the point where I would hear these questions every single day. I'd be talking to a colleague, I'd be talking to students, I'd be giving a presentation. Every single day, I would hear these two questions. What gives you hope? And how do you have a conversation about this issue? So I thought about these. I wanted to give a good answer. I didn't want to give a facile answer. I mean, hope is not just burying your head in the sand and hoping everything's going to be okay. I figured, I think I probably need to start with what doesn't give us hope, right? Let's sort of get out what doesn't give us hope because all too often when we're confronted with this unprecedented experiment that we're conducting with the only home we have, we want to put our hope in something. So we tend to put our hope in a policy, a politician, a solution. And then when not everybody adopts that solution or when that policy doesn't get put through or when it does, but it doesn't accomplish what we thought it should, or when the politician gets elected, but then they can't live up to their promises, we get discouraged and depressed and frustrated. And people today are even more hopeless than they were before because they put their hope so often in things that didn't pan out. So what hope is not? First of all, I don't know if you remember reading this book. This kind of dates me, but I read this book growing up too. Hope is not wishful thinking. You know, if I just hope and wish it to be so, it will. No, that's not going to fix climate change. And imitating the mythical ostrich, because ostriches don't really do this, that's not going to fix climate change either. The science doesn't give us a lot of hope either. Glaciers are melting faster. Sea levels are rising faster. The costs of climate change are underestimated. The pace is underestimated. None of this gives us hope. And the politics doesn't give us a lot of hope either. Did you know that the United States is now more politically polarized than any other country? And it's more politically polarized than it's been since the Civil War. And we all know how that went. 
I'm Canadian and I even know how that went. Increasingly, according to research done by the Beyond Conflict Institute, and they've studied, they've worked in Northern Ireland, they've worked in South Africa, they've worked in some of the most divisive and conflict-filled areas in the world. Increasingly, Americans who identify as either Democrat or Republican, both, either one, everybody's like, oh, it's that, that's just those people. No, it's both sides. View one another less as fellow citizens and more as enemies who represent a profound threat to their identities. And when this mindset develops, compromise with the other side is viewed as weakness or betrayal and their gain is seen as our loss. And they went on to talk about how we start to not even view people as human or treat them as human. So before the pandemic hit, which feels like it was what, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, <laughs> or yesterday, you know, it's sort of like this weird time warp. Before the pandemic hit, this was a survey of the most politically polarized topics in the United States. The width of the gray bar is how far apart Democrats and Republicans are. And the wider the gray bar, the further apart they are, and it's ranked in order. What's right at the top there, climate change and environmental protection is right there at the top and it's been there for 10 years. Well, then the pandemic happened and these got shuffled around a little bit. Guess what moved right up to the top? The pandemic. Addressing issues around race, dealing with global climate change, and dealing with the COVID outbreak became the most politicized issues in the US. And the only reason climate change is not number one is because Democrat levels of concern dropped. When we ask people, is this thing real? Most people across the country say yes. This is a map from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. Anywhere that's any county that's orange means more than 50% of people say yes. And the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. And I highlighted Salt Lake County right here, 76%. People say it's happening, but here's the thing. We're worried, 70% of Americans are worried. 83% of mothers are worried. 86% of young people are worried, but half of us feel hopeless and don't know where to start. And only 8% are activated. We often think the biggest gap is between people who do or do not agree with the science. And those who don't agree with the science are very loud, but they're only a small fraction of us. The biggest gap we have is between people who are already worried but not activated. That's the biggest problem we have. And our mindset shifts when we realize that, right? It's not about taking your uncle or your neighbor or somebody you know who is constantly posting on Facebook saying that it's made up and those scientists are you know, making it up and there's more polar bears now than there ever used to be. It's not about convincing that person that the science is real. It's about talking to everybody who's already worried about it, but they don't know what to do about it. That's the biggest problem we have. And a big reason for that is what? We aren't talking about it. Now, I'm sorry that the Zoom is sort of blocking the, the title here, so let me read it. The estimated percentage of adults who ever talk about climate change, even occasionally. They don't even talk about it occasionally. So if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever wanna do anything to fix it? I zoomed in here so you can see. So. National average, 35%, Salt Lake County, slightly higher. But don't pat yourselves on the back because 37% is not great. Yeah, you can see, you know, even Colorado, like there's no, there's no orange on this map. And they didn't ask you to talk about it every week. They said you even talk about it once in a while. Why not? Well, one of the reasons is because we don't think it matters to us. If you ask people, what's the first image that pops into your head when I say climate change, what do you think most people say? It's something that is big and it's white and it's furry. Yes, thank you, polar bear. And now, unless there's a population of polar bears running around Utah that I don't know about, that's not something that's really relevant to people's lives. I am from Canada. And and even where I live in Canada, we do not have polar bears running around. I had to go way far up north to even see some polar bears, which I did with polar bear scientists. We think 
It matters in the future to people who live over there. We don't know how to communicate how it matters to others. And this is really important. We don't think there's anything proactive that we can do to fix it. So climate changes and we get worried. And here's what we do. We're worried and we look around at everybody else and we see that nobody's doing anything. We feel. So we think they're not doing anything because they're not worried, we think. So if someone's not worried about something, what's the natural thing to do? They should be worried, right? So you load up on all the scary data, and there's a lot of scary data that's very true, and you dump it on them. But what happens if you're already really worried, but you don't know what to do and somebody dumps more scary information on you? We just turn it off because we can't cope with it. You just want to go back to bed and pull the blankets up over your head, right? And what happens? Ironically, inaction results. Tally Sherrod is a neuroscientist and she wrote a great book called The Influential Mind that isn't about climate change at all, but it's actually entirely about climate change at the same time. She's explaining how our brains work. And here's what she says. She says, fear and anxiety, and this is quite literally the way our brains work. Fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And so we close the loop and climate just changes more. We've been stuck in this loop for 50 years. And every day, in fact, I just had somebody on, a bunch of people on social media just yesterday, because I was posting about hope versus fear. I had a bunch of people push back and say, no, 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 we need to scare people more. I said, well, how has that worked out the last 50 years? Everybody who is gonna be scared is already scared, but we're not activated. So would you consider trying something different? And for me, my response to this fear, again, comes back to my faith. I'm sort of, you know, returning at intervals here to sort of show you how this goes a level deeper. And one of my most meaningful verses that I depend on a lot comes from Timothy, where it says, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So it's a litmus test. If we are reacting out of fear, that is not from God, but we've been given something. We've been given power, which is an old fashioned word, but we use it today more in the sense of being empowered. Now, what did we just say fear does? What does fear do? It paralyzes us. What does being empowered do? It enables us to act. It's the opposite. How? In love, which means we're considering others' needs. And as a scientist, my favorite part, with a sound mind to make good decisions, which are based on what science tells us. That's my interpretation. If I ever get to time travel back, then I'll be like, you need to add science in there. <laughs> so how can we talk about this in a way that engenders hope, not fear, in a way that empowers people and gives them agency rather than paralyzing them? I think there's two keys to this. We have to recognize that the problem isn't that most people aren't worried. The problem is we can't relate it to our lives here and now. And we don't know what we can do to fix it. This is what we have to talk about. The idea that we don't understand how it affects us is something called psychological distance. And as humans, we're all really good at this. What is psychological distance? It's the idea that sure that's real, but it's only gonna affect me in the future. Sure it's real, but it affects those people over there, not me. Sure it's real, but it's sort of abstract rather than concrete. And it doesn't matter to my concerns. I have other things to worry about. So we all do this. I mean, I won't, I'm not going to ask for any show of hands. We're not going back to the polling tool for this. I'm just going to ask you to think about this. Who here exercises exactly as much as they're supposed to and stands up every 30 minutes when they're at the computer? Not going to ask for a show of hands, just leaving it with you. Who here eats exactly what they should be eating according to what the doctors and nutritionists tell us and they never sneak that extra piece of cake? I'm thinking of myself here too, not just you, who, you know, we don't save enough for retirement. We don't plan for what we're supposed to do. Why? Psychological distance. Well, we see this loud and clear in these maps. I started with this map before, is climate change actually happening? And most people say yes. And then when you ask, you can ask people, will it harm plants and animals? Most people say yes. Now, where's the psychological distance there? plants and animals, non-human species? Will it harm future generations? Where's the psychological distance there? Future generations, not now. 
Will it harm people in developing countries over there, not here? Now, all of these maps are nice and orange, right? Then they ask one more question. Will it harm you? Yeah. Will it harm you? No. So how do we turn this around? When we have conversations about climate change, we need to talk about how it is now, it is here, it is concrete, and it's relevant to me, right? And then we have to talk about what we can do to fix it too. We can't just, if somebody tells you there's a problem and they don't tell you how to fix it, what's the point? I'd rather not know about the problem. Being very honest here, I really would rather not know. If there's nothing you can do about it at all, then why even know about it? Why not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, so to speak? It turns out that social scientists have been studying this too, and there's a word for this too. So the previous one was so, 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 excuse me, psychological distance. This one is efficacy. If I do something, will it make a difference? That's what efficacy is. And it turns out that we're willing to act if we think it will make a difference. That makes sense, right? Why do something if it's not gonna make a difference? But today we have a stunning lack of efficacy. When I travel in person, I bundle and I've been doing it for some time. David shared how I did, how many events was that David? 26 events, 26 events last time I was here. And the pandemic caught me in the middle of 18 events in Ireland. I start first thing in the morning, I go to last thing at night because I wanna make every ounce of carbon count. But then I read that they're flying 3,000 empty flights just to keep their gate assignments. I'm like, what's the point? I was talking to a woman a while ago who said um, that she is so frugal with her plastic waste that you could put her plastic waste from a year in a small bag. Like that's how good she is at avoiding plastic waste. And then she said, and she's fine now, but she said she had a heart attack and she ended up in the hospital. And within one day, the mountain of plastic waste that they created caring for her exceeded everything she produced over the last 10 years. And she's like, why am I doing this? We feel this stunning lack of efficacy because we feel like we do everything we can to reduce our personal footprint, to, you know, to not produce carbon or, or plastic pollution. And then everything else, everybody else just produces way more. So how do we tackle these two issues, psychological distance and lack of efficacy? We do it by starting with the one thing we're not doing. And I'm not talking about recycling. I'm not talking about changing light bulbs. I'm not talking about plug-in cars or solar panels. The thing that we're not doing, you saw this map before, remember, what are we not doing? We're not talking about it. Now, is talking sufficient? Of course not. But is talking necessary? 100%. How do we get anything done as humans if we don't talk? Communicate. Now, sometimes you might be you know, verbally speaking. Sometimes you might be writing. Sometimes you might be posting on social media. Sometimes you might just be doing something where someone else can see you doing it. That's a form of talking too, right? But not about the polar bears and the ice sheets, unless you're a polar bear living on an ice sheet. If you are, then yes. But if you're not, you wanna talk about how climate change affects you here in Utah in ways that are relevant to your life and what real solutions look like. I was in Iowa virtually a few months ago and someone literally asked me, how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't. When I am in Texas, I talk about cotton. When we're here, we talk about wildfires. We talk about snow and our water supply and the ski industry and tourism and the jobs. We talk about air quality and heat. We talk about how it matters to us here and now in ways that are relevant to everyone living here today. So what gives me hope, what does give me hope is recognizing that there are solutions. But we really have to realize that hope begins in a dark place. If everything was going fine, do you need hope? No, you need hope when everything is not going fine. You need hope when we're not sure whether things are gonna work out or not. You need a hope that accepts that success is not guaranteed, but we need a hope that provides a vision of a better future. And the science even has this. 
So these giant IPCC reports I talked about, the Code Red report, the Houses on Fire report, and the Manual to the Fire Extinguisher report, you know how they conclude? They conclude like this. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. Is that not an empowering conclusion from what I often think of as the doorstops of doom? They're very big, heavy reports. They will keep the door open if you need it to. David mentioned how my TED Talk doesn't have as many views as Greta, and that's totally fine. I'm happy to be mentioned in the same breath. And I think that she knows a few things about action. And this is what she said, which is really interesting. She said, the one thing we need more than hope, so we need hope, right? But there's one thing we need more, and that is action. Why? Because when we start to act, hope is all around us. And I saw this when I went to the climate meetings in Glasgow. So I went there and within two or three days of those meetings starting in Glasgow in November, there were articles around the world saying they're a failure, they aren't accomplishing anything, nothing's getting done. And I'm like, people, it's meeting number 26. Who expected meeting number 26 to magically solve the problem? I mean, it's, we've had 26 meetings. You expect each meeting to have an incremental success, and it did. The entire goal of that meeting was to finalize Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And guess what? They finalized Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. But they also agreed to phase down coal. They agreed to halt deforestation in a number of countries. And it wasn't just about the countries there. What gave me the most hope was being there with young people. Like this young man, he's 12 years old. He's from Colombia. He's received death threats for the environmental activism he does. Yet he is the most cheerful and hope-filled person I've ever met in my life. I talked to people from big companies like Ikea and Nestle. Amazon. The Rotary Club was there. Every single church you can imagine was there. Theologians were there. Students were there. Children were there. Grandparents were there. The world was there showing that climate action matters. Too often, we think about climate action as if it's a giant boulder at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it. And if I had my hand, it won't budge an inch. So why do it? That's lack of efficacy. But when we start to look around and see all the things that are happening, and you in this room represent, and you listening online too, represent many of those things that are happening. And when we use our voice to share what's happening, we realize the giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. I just couldn't find a picture with millions of hands on it that was royalty free. But if, you, if anybody wants to draw me one, I would accept it gratefully. There's millions of hands on it. And if you add your hand, it will go a little faster. And if you use your voice to encourage others to add their hand, it will go even faster. So when people say, how do I talk about this? You already know the answer, right? How do you talk about this? In a way that induces hope, not dread. In a way that focuses here and now, as opposed to in the future or far away. And in a way that emphasizes what real solutions look like. But again, and I mentioned this before, but I wanna come back to this because this is something we often get hung up on. Who are we talking to? Turns out that across the United States, most of us are alarmed, concerned, or cautious. Only 8% are dismissive. And my personal definition of somebody who's dismissive is if an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real appeared to them, they would reject them. So who are we to think that we could change their minds? We, most of us know someone who's dismissive and they say, well, how, how do I have a conversation with them? And my answer is, this is what I would say. And this is what I do say. You're wrong, but I love you. And let's talk about something else. But to everybody else who's not dismissive, we can talk about yes, how it is real, the gap between the people who say it is or isn't real is 25%, but the bigger gap, there's a 30% gap between the people who say it's real, but they don't understand how it matters to me. So if you have a conversation about how it matters to us, you're tackling a bigger gap. And then the activation gap, there's a 65% gap between people who say it's real and people who are activated. So if you're gonna spend your time, where is the most profitable place to spend our time? On people who might say, sure, it's real, but they don't understand why it matters or what we can do to fix it. And what do we need to talk about? Why and how it matters to us and how we can fix it. 
So how do we do this? I wanna give you a very simple formula. It's three steps and it begins with this. Bond over something that we have in common. Don't begin with something we disagree on, begin with something we agree on. Now, when I was writing my book, um, I asked my sister to give it a read. My sister is actually a, a technical editor and a very good writer. And so she read the whole book and she's like, well, it's great, but you're missing a chapter. I was like, ooh, this is the final draft. What do you mean I'm missing a chapter? And she's like, you're missing a chapter in how you actually do it. Like, how do you actually have these conversations? Where do you start? So I said, you're right, we need to do that. I said, here's where we have to start. We have to start, first of all, with understanding where people are at. We have to understand that, and again, going back to what we believe, if we need hope, that means we're in a dark place. Hope begins with suffering. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And why does hope not disappoint? Because of love. So what is bonding with people over shared values? What is beginning a conversation with something we agree on rather than we disagree on? It's expressing love for the people we love, the places we love, the things we love. Start with love. Begin the conversation with love. And that's very different than the place a lot of our conversations begin today, isn't it? So if we begin with love, if we realize that the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love, and love again is not exclusive to any of us. All humans demonstrate love. Animals demonstrate love too, right? Love is what brings us together. All of us living things are brought together by love. When we begin our conversations with love, they end up in a very different place than if we begin with what divides us. So then we need to connect the dots to how who we are is the perfect person to care. And how do we do that? Well, I do an exercise. And now I'm going to ask you to do this too, okay? I take an inventory of who I am. Who do I love? What do I love? Where do I love? And then that's where I can start the conversation with people. So first of all, I love science. So I can definitely talk to people who love science. I am from Canada, so I can talk to fellow Canadians. I live in Texas, so I can talk to people who live in Texas about what's happening where we live. I really love snow. And so I can talk to people about that too. I'm a mom. And so I've, I've actually helped to create an organization called Science Moms. That's for moms who care about climate change and want to help their kids. And I'm a Christian. So I can talk to other people who share that with me too. So we're almost getting to the end here where you're going to ask me questions. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get your phones back out now. Some of you have already had, had them out taking pictures and that's good. And I want to ask you to give me a word. Here's the word this time. I care about climate change because I am a what? And I don't wanna see the same words here. I wanna see completely different words. Why do you care about climate change? Do you care because you're a gardener? Do you care because you're a birder? Do you care because you're a student? Do you care because you're a grandparent? Why do you care about climate change? Whoever you are, oh, I love this. We're already seeing different answers. That's perfect. These answers are all different. And don't forget if you're online, you can do this too. Go to poll, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Catherine with two A's. Whoever we are is already the perfect person to care. Think about that again. Whoever you are, you're already the perfect person to care. And whoever somebody else is, they're already the perfect person to care too. But they might not be the same person as you. So somebody might care because they're an architect. Somebody else might care because they're a beekeeper. Somebody else might care because they're an astronomer. Does everybody have to become a beekeeper to care about climate change? No. Now that might sound slightly ridiculous, but I hear all the time from people who say, everybody has to care because of the reason I care. It's like a gate. I have a gate and everybody has to go through my gate to care about climate change. Well, trying to fit everybody through your gate is going to be pretty tough. If you have to make everybody into a gardener to care about climate change, I don't think that's going to work. And I say that as somebody who loves gardening myself, but it just isn't going to happen. But if you help them see, okay, you might not be a gardener, but you have a dog. You might not be a gardener, but you are an educator. You might not be a gardener, but you are a grandparent. You might not be any of these things, but you are a human, right? then you have every reason you need to care. And isn't that completely different? We're not trying to make everybody care for the same reason we do. We're trying to figure out why they already care and helping them see that. Isn't this a beautiful set of words? I love this. 
And I love how different they are. I mean, the variety here is just incredible. And that's exactly the point, right? Whoever you are is already the perfect person to care. So bond over something we share, connect the dots to how we both care about it. And then last of all, and I'm deliberate landing my presentation with this too, right? Last of all, I'll talk about real solutions. Talk about what real solutions look like. Talk about climate solutions that stop all that carbon from going into the atmosphere, like clean energy and even efficiency. Did you know that through efficiency alone, we could cut our carbon emissions in half and save money? We're so wasteful. Over 30, over 67% of the energy we produce and over 40% of the food we produce is wasted. Through reducing waste, we can feed more people, we can provide energy for more people and we can cut our carbon emissions. If you converted the whole US power grid to 80% clean energy by 2030, and I would just like to say Texas is almost at 25%, the US would avoid almost $2 trillion in health and other damage costs. Did you know that we have too much carbon in the atmosphere, but we don't have enough of it in our soils and our ecosystems where we want it. And according to work that we've done at the Nature Conservancy, if we could restore our ecosystems, if we could protect ecosystems, if we could restore degraded ecosystems and coastal wetlands and smart agriculture that puts carbon back in the soil where it's a fertilizer, we could meet over a third of our Paris goals just through investing in nature, which of course invests in biodiversity as well, cleans up our air, provides flood protection and more. So we've got climate solutions that take that carbon out of the atmosphere, whether it's through farming or forests. We've got climate solutions that help systems and communities in need. Did you know that a lot of low-income neighborhoods in the United States they were historically redlined, which were racist practices of mortgages and insurance and lending, so that now they're often located in flood zones. During a heat wave, they can be 10 to 15 degrees hotter than richer neighborhoods because they don't have tree coverage. They have much poorer air quality as well. So greening low-income neighborhoods through green spaces and trees provides flood control, lowers the temperature during heat waves, filters the air to improve air quality, provides green spaces for people to take their families to play. Oh, and it takes up carbon too. These types of win-win-win solutions are amazing. Restoring coastal ecosystems, mangrove forests help with, with marine ecosystems and they protect from storm surge, which is what we want as storms are getting stronger and investing in sustainable drought resilient agriculture. Somebody whose name I didn't even know until I was writing my book is Tony Renato. Have you ever heard his name? He's an agronomist from Australia who's been working with World Vision for 40 years in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he figured out that through planting trees beside and in fields, you can actually make crops more drought resistant. The tree's roots trap moisture and nutrients in the soil. And he has helped farmers produce enough food to feed millions more people through the simple step of planting trees. There's incredible things that we can do and climate solutions can be win-win-wins. Climate solutions can give us cleaner air and cleaner water today. They can protect us from disasters today. They can improve our mental and our physical health. They can provide us with more affordable energy today. Solar energy is already the cheapest form of electricity humans have ever had. They can reduce our inequalities. They can create healthy ecosystems and foodscapes and they can give us a more stable world. Oh, and they can help with climate change too. Who's on board? Is anybody on board? Yes, there's a lot of people on board. There's entire countries on board. There's really big companies on board. There's states and provinces, of course, on board. There's cities on board, all kinds of cities all around the world including Texas, the home of the, sorry, Houston, the home of the oil and gas industry in the United States. There's churches on board. There's leaders of every denomination and tradition you can imagine who are on board. There's universities and seminaries on board. There's young people, moms, seniors, all kinds of people on board from all around the world. I mean, isn't this amazing? I've just shown you some of the hands on that boulder. There are millions of hands on that boulder, rolling it down the hill, 
It's already moving in the right direction. It's going faster every day. It isn't quite going fast enough yet. And that's where we need you. Because the world is truly changing. 90% of new energy installed during 2020 around the world was clean energy. But it isn't going fast enough yet. And that's where we come in. The goal of our conversation of using our voice is to focus not on our carbon footprint, but on our climate shadow. How we affect those around us, where we live, where we work, where we worship. All of us are part of something bigger than ourselves. We're part of a university. We're part of a congregation. We're part of a city. We're part of a business. We're part of a place of work. We're part of a social network. And our goal when we have these conversations is not to tell people about this. It's to bring people in to expand the conversation, to show them how who they already are is already the perfect person to care and how there's climate actions that are entirely consistent and compatible with who they are. So climate changes and we get worried, remember? But what do we do? What do you do? Do you load up all the scary facts and dump them on people? If they're already worried, nope, that's not what you do. You share how it affects us and what real positive constructive solutions look like. People feel empowered by that and change results. And you know what? Let's go back to how our brains are wired. What does the neuroscience say? It says that our human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not threat. People say, does, does our voice really matter? And I wanna conclude with this. I've been thinking about this. I realized that change, I wrote this after the first IPCC report came out. It's for an essay for Time Magazine. Change did not begin when somebody big and rich and powerful and influential woke up one morning and decided that it should change. It wasn't the King of England deciding to end slavery or the president of the United States giving women the vote or the National Party of South Africa opting to end apartheid. Changes began when ordinary people of no particular power or wealth or fame decided the world could and should be different. Who were William Wilberforce, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and all the countless others who shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world? They were not rich or famous or influential or powerful as individuals, but together they were people who had the courage of their convictions, who used their voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. Who were these people? They were us. We are the people who changed the world before and we are the people who can change it again because that's the only way our modern industrialized society has changed. So with that, the only question I have left is what are we waiting for? The future really is in our hands and every single one of us has a role to play beginning with our voice. So that's why I wrote my book. That's what, that's the, the answers to the questions that people have. And now I just wanna ask you one more question before you turn around and ask me questions. Here's the last question for you. Now, when I say climate change, how do you feel? How do you feel knowing that you can make a difference? How do you feel knowing that our voices are the most powerful force that we have for change? How do you feel knowing that countries, companies, Cities, churches, young people, old people, people all around the world have their hands on that boulder and is rolling down the hill faster and faster. You might still feel anxious. You might still feel worried. And we should be because we, it is bad. We should feel worried. But hope begins in a dark place. It begins with recognizing that success is not guaranteed, but it is possible. How is it possible? if we do everything we can. So I love this, look at this. Motivated, empowered, hopeful, activated, exactly, encouraged, energized, determined, I love that. It isn't easy, but we can do it. And every single one of us can do it, but we can't do it alone, we have to do it together. And when we use our voice, what are we doing? We're connecting with other people, doing it together. That's how I truly believe we can save us. So now it's time for your questions. We have a little over 20 minutes for your questions. And here's, you get to put any question you want. You don't have to put one word. You don't have to pick A, B, or C, but here's the fun part. You can upvote the questions you most want me to get to. 
speaking from experience, we often get a lot more questions that we can get to. So whether you're online or whether you're here in person, you can type in any question you want. And if you don't have a cell phone, speak to your neighbor. I'm sure your neighbor would be happy to type it in for you. Any question you want. And even if you don't have a question, go ahead and look at the questions there. And somebody's already got the hang of this. Upvote the questions that you most want answered, okay? I trust in your collective wisdom. So we're going to go for the most common questions. <laughs> I know, this is fun. And again, this is all anonymous. The first time I ever did this, while I'm waiting for these to come up, the first time I ever did this was with a bunch of middle schoolers. That was a pretty big risk. I made sure there was a language filter on it, <laughs> but I have to say they were great. I mean, there was some silly questions, but most of the questions were awesome. So, well, okay. The first one's the easiest to answer. It depends. How many events are you gonna bundle for me? <laughs> when people ask what the single most, I love this. You are really getting into these upvotes. They're, they're changing around so quick. We can't even keep track of them. All right. I'm going to go with the one at the top right now, but I realize that this may change. When people ask what is the single most important thing they could do to help the environment or climate change, what should I tell them besides telling them to talk about it? I've thought a lot about this. And my answer has varied over the years. And here's what I'm at, where I'm at today. Do something, anything, and talk about it. So every year I adopt two new habits and I talk about them. It might be reducing food waste. It might be trying out meatless Mondays. It might be cutting out plastic in the, in the bathroom. It might be cutting up a credit card from a bank that provides a lot of fossil fuel funding. It might be deciding to start a new social media account to talk about climate change. That's what I did this year, trying out TikTok with the help of my cat. It gets a lot more views than I do but I can dub climate change information over the cat, right? <coughs> Do something, anything, and talk about it. And there's actually a really good resource that is, um, you, did anybody see the movie Don't Look Up? Okay, on Netflix about the comet that's hitting the earth and nobody's listening to the scientists. And of course, it's a metaphor for climate change. In fact, frankly, I have lived in some of those very situations myself. So if it were up to me, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to, this is a little bit of a spoiler here, I apologize. If it were up to me, I would have restarted the movie halfway through and then had an alternate ending where it showed how people using their voices to advocate for change were able to change the outcome of the movie. I actually had the opportunity to share this with Netflix and they said, well, that's a great idea, but I'm afraid that Leonardo is already on to his next project. <laughs> I was like, wow, I didn't even expect you to take it that seriously. <laughs> But they said, here's what we do want to do. We're going to create a website that is a climate action website to a company don't look up. And so because I'm on my computer here, I'm going to see if I can, here we go, open a window and show it to you. So if you look for don't, don't look up, count us in, here's what the website looks like. I'm going to show you so you can find it later. If you want to take a picture of it with your phone or you can take a screenshot, you have a picture of Leonardo looking, looking very concerned, saying, love living on earth, but hate the planet killing comets, ready to stop freaking out and start doing something. And then it's got six solutions everybody can do. And here's the interesting thing. These are based on things that I shared and 30 other experts shared on how we can change the system as individuals. Here's the six things. Talk about it. Join a group. And there's lots of great groups, right? LDS too. Join a group. Magnify your voice. Make your money count. Keep politicians accountable. Spark ideas at work. I fought for school here too. I couldn't believe they wouldn't put school on there, but school and work. Push for climate headlines. And then down here, it says, see all steps. So if you click down here and see all steps, it's got cut food waste, eat more veggies. Now, notice here, it doesn't say eat less meat, it says eat more veggies, see? Switch to clean energy, get around greener, fly less, be kind to your mind, that's a good one. And, oh, of course, talk about it. 
So really we need everybody doing everything. And that's why I love this is because it sort of frees you up. It's like, there's no, there's no, you know, 10 commandments of thou shalt do A, B, C, or D. It's do whatever you can do and then talk about it. Share what you're doing and encourage other people because why do you do something? It's because you've heard somebody else do it. So for example, people say, you know, I never thought about doing this until somebody else said this to me. I've had scientists say, I never thought about bundling my travel or asking if I could do it virtually until I heard you say that. I never thought about trying a plant-based burger until somebody else said, hey, you really should try it. It's really good. How do we do anything? It's when somebody talks about it. So plant-based eating, of course it's useful because industrial animal agriculture, I'm not talking about you know, free range grazing, I'm talking about the large industrial scale animal agriculture, it contributes to 7% of our heat trapping gas emissions. That's a big chunk of the pie. Plus we eat a lot more meat than we need to, plus it's more expensive. Plus if you're getting cheap meat, it might be coming from whether deforesting the Amazon in Brazil. So yes, eating more plants is good for us. It's good for our health. It's good for our budget. Oh, and it's good for climate change too. It's one of those win, win, wins. What do I say when religious people say God is in control? Well, you know what? You just hit the nail on the head because that's the number one religiously sounding objection I hear. It is at the top. I say, read the Bible. Because in Genesis 1, it says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this earth. And in Revelation, it says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. So where do these religiously sounding objections come from? They sound pious, but they aren't they don't even have any theological basis. They come from the fact that we don't want to fix this thing. We think the cure is worse than the disease. But if you say there's this global problem that's affecting the poorest people in the world, but I don't want to fix it, you don't sound like a very good person to yourself, let alone to anybody else. So we engage in what's called motivated reasoning. We go out and we look for reasons to explain why we don't want to fix it. And this one sounds really good. It sounds pious. It sounds religious but it's just wrong. Um, I have a little uh, web series called Global Weirding. I don't know if you've seen it. I'm gonna show this to you here. Um, and we, we made Global Weirding, if it, just go to uh, globalweirdingseries.com. There we go. It's on YouTube. And it, each little video answers frequently asked questions about climate change. And I said, well, I'd love to do a video on these you know, religiously sounding questions I get. Like, you know, if God's in control, how could this happen? So I was doing it with our local PBS station. They said, sure, we can do that. So we made it. And it turns out that that video, what does the Bible say about climate change, was our most popular video. That's the one everybody wanted to watch. Now, it just got overtaken. I'm sorry, the internet's a little bit slow here. It should be showing up in a minute. It just got overtaken by, I'm just a kid. How can I make a difference? And that was a really fun video to make because kids are absolutely amazing. So unfortunately, this is not coming up, but believe me, it would be global weirding if we saw it. And then we also have, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. That's what it looks like, global weirding. And it's me talking with some little cartoons. And like I said, now the second most popular episode is the Bible doesn't talk about climate change, right? And the first one is I'm just a kid. And then we also have that program I talked about called Science Moms, where we have recommendations of books to read with your kids, your grandchildren, videos that you can share on social media. Um, this is one of my fellow scientists, Joellen Russell. <laughs> She's awesome. She's an oceanographer and she is a mama bear too. And she lives in Arizona where she has to wake her kids up in the morning in the summer so they can play outside while it's dark because it's too hot during the day. We're a group of moms who care about climate change and anybody can sign up and get the resources here as well at Science Moms. Okay, back to your questions, because there's a lot of good ones. What more do we have here? Just a second here. Okay. Um, what are your favorite books? Well, being a scientist, I have a list. I made an Amazon list of my favorite books. <laughs> so, And I'm about to turn that into a Pinterest board of my favorite books as well. So there are a lot of great books and really I can't recommend one because it really depends on what you're interested in, but there's a really good book. Well, first of all, the Pope wrote a book, right? The encyclical, Laudato Si. There's a really good book on called Caring for Creation for um, Evangelicals to Care About Climate Change. I don't know that there's a book for LDS specifically. That's an opportunity there. There's a lot of good resources online. I'm not sure if there's a published book yet. Is there? 
compilation. Okay, which is called? Hope of Nature. Oh, of course, by George, Hope of Nature. Um, and, and on the science, if you're, if you're really looking for an overview of the science, I would say a thinking person's guide to climate is probably a really good one that sort of gives you the whole breadth of the science if you're looking for that. Um, how can I teach my children to be climate resilient and hopeful? Show them how kids are making a difference. Kids are amazing. Once you start to look at what kids are doing, and we had that little global weirding video, I mean, they are hitting it out of the park. So let me tell you a fun story. I was giving a talk at a church in Edinburgh on, um, a number of years ago, and it wasn't for kids. Um, and there was a man coming who worked in a renewable energy company, and his son was, I think, seven years old at the time, and he didn't have a babysitter, so he had to bring his son. He said, it's okay, you can just bring your books, and you can just sit there and read while I'm at this talk. So he brought his son, and his son, who was seven years old, sat there and listened to the whole thing. And then afterwards, he said, Dad, I have to do something. This is a big deal. I have to do something about it. His dad said, well, it's okay. I've got it. I work for a renewable energy company. We live in Scotland. We're going to be 100% clean energy soon, and they're actually 99% clean energy already by today. Don't worry about it. His, and his son said, no, I have to do something about it. So he thought about it. He said, you know, at our school, they leave the lights on all the time. They don't put the right things in the recycling bin. There's food waste. They're doing all these things they shouldn't be doing. I'm going to make a club. And we're going to go around and tell people what they should be doing. So he made this club of his friends. And his dad said it totally changed his life. He came home from school every day, just absolutely full, brimming over with excitement over how he told Miss Harris that she had not put the paper in the right bit. <laughs> but he loved it because he was doing something. And I mean, kids are just incredible. They are speaking up, obviously. But they are also serving on, you know, advisory panels and boards for big companies. They're making changes in their school. They're making changes, obviously, in their families and their communities. They're creating inventions to charge your cell phone that costs $5 and use solar and wind energy. There was a young woman who um, created an algae biofuel experiment originally under her bed until her mother kicked her into the garage, and she won a national science fair for algae biofuel. I mean, there are kids doing amazing things, so tell your kids stories of what other kids are doing. Because really, if we just put the kids in charge, I think they could fix this for us. Um, this, this is a really big challenge and it's really because I feel like sort of the tail wags the dog when it comes to politics. When you look at where change is happening, it is happening in cities. It is happening in companies. It is happening in schools. But then you get up to the federal level and at the federal level in the United States, due to the two party system, there's just this entrenchment of lobbying and funds and special interests and remember the political polarization I was talking about, to where any compromise is seen as betrayal. So it's gotten to the point where people would rather, you know, cut off their nose despite their face, so to speak. But the reality is we all share this planet and a wildfire does not knock at your door and say, excuse me, who did you vote for in the last presidential election before it burns down your house? This matters to all of us and we need solutions for all of us. So I wanna encourage you with something really, really interesting. I was part of an experiment a couple of, um, just a couple of years ago, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna try to find it here. Uh, where what we did was we made three or four short videos on climate change. But what we did was we started those videos. Remember, what do you start with? You start with what you agree on, not what you disagree on. So they said, we're going to make four videos that start with values that Republicans typically share. Like what? Free market, personal liberties and libertarian values, national defense, and Christianity. So this is a retired Air, uh, Army general. They had a two-time Republican congressman. Bob Inglis, they had Jerry Taylor, who had a libertarian think tank, and they had me as a scientist and a Christian. We made these one and a half minute videos talking about climate change, impacts and solutions from our perspectives, free market, personal liberties, national security, and faith. And then here's where the Yale researchers came in. They took these videos and they put them on social media and they paid to boost them into people's feeds on social media in three purple districts. Purple meaning about the same number of Republicans and Democrats. And then they tracked public opinion in these districts as these videos were showing up in people's Facebook feeds and in their YouTube feeds. 
Democrat opinions on climate change went up a bit, high single digits, seven, eight, nine percent. What do you think happened to Republican opinions? They went up twice as much. Twice as much. Why? Because this conversation was starting with something they agreed on and they could see themselves in it. I've done an experiment where I recorded a 30 minute talk and then we showed that 30 minute talk. It was a recording, not an in-person talk at three different Christian colleges. All three of them were equally theologically conservative, but they were very different politically. The first one was extremely conservative politically. The second one was sort of middle of the road. And then the third one was in Canada. So it wasn't, wasn't at all political. That was sort of our control. So in each of those colleges, one in Texas, one in upstate New York, one in Canada, we showed them the same video that was only different in one respect. It talked about how climate change was affecting people in Texas or New York or Ontario. That was what was different. But other than that, it was framed the same way um, as, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm a scientist and here's what's happening, here's why it matters and here's what solutions look like. And we tested all the students before they watched the video and then we tested them after they watched the video. And in one group, we actually did a delayed test several months later. Each group improved, but here's the interesting thing. They all improved. So they started off here, here, and here. That's where they started off. Each group improved to the same level. So what happened to the most conservative group? They improved the most. How? By starting with something we had in common, by connecting the dots to show them how they're the perfect person to care and by offering positive constructive solutions. So there is evidence that this actually works. It might not work overnight. It might be conversations over the course of who knows, weeks, months, even years, but change really can happen. And when we share these stories with each other, I think that's what encourages us to keep going. All right, do we have time for a couple more questions? Maybe I'll just do a speed round to end. How's that? Okay. I have to get the questions back up here to do the speed round. All right. I think we've been doing pretty good. And you've been doing fantastic, by the way, on sorting these questions. This is really good. How do you deal with bad actors? Well, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There is definitely the calling out publicly, for sure. Then there's also the people like engine number one, where they got on the board of Exxon to force them to have a climate resolution. That was really smart. And then there's people inside who are working too. So at every single level, there's people working. Why is the faith-based perspective so important? It's important because 85% of people around the world come from a faith tradition. And if we're to start with something we have in common, that's one of the most obvious places to start. Now, it's not the only one. I've started conversations over our shared love of knitting. I've started conversations over the fact that I love beaches and I'm worried about how sea level rise is going to affect them. I've started conversations over being a mother. I've started conversations over, I like a good glass of wine. So it doesn't have to be this, but the closer it is to our hearts, the more directly it impacts us. So that's, I think, why that matters. Um, why, why is there not one sort of silver bullet? It's because there isn't one source of energy that works for everybody everywhere, but rather there's a bunch of different sources of energy. And I talk about a lot of them in my book. Um, everything from the new modular nuclear reactors that they're putting, they're trying out in Utah. So did you know you're the guinea pigs for the new little tiny modular nuclear reactors that they put together? So you don't make one big one, you put together little ones that are prefab. It's like a prefab nuclear reactor and it's way cheaper. Like I'm talking a hundred times cheaper than traditional nuclear. It's almost the same price as wind, not quite, but almost. And if you don't locate it in an area that's geologically active, then you don't have to be worried about the issues that they've had like in Japan, but it still has the waste issues, right? And there's still a price for our energy. I mean, even with solar energy and with wind turbines, they're having to try to figure out how do you recycle these things, right? So there is no free energy lunch. And there's a myth. People are like, oh, well, if there's no free energy lunch, then we should just use fossil fuels. No, there is a very expensive energy lunch that will cost us civilization as we know it, not to mention 10 million premature deaths a year from air pollution from burning fossil fuels. And then there is a way to get energy that still has a cost to it, mining the rare earth minerals that we put into the batteries, figuring out how to recycle the solar panels and the wind turbines. We need to do better, we can do better, 
But with human civilization at risk, we have to do everything we can right now. And this is actually a really good question. Um, how important is individual action compared to system-wide change? People often phrase it this way. They say, do we need individual action or do we need system-wide change? What do you think my answer to that is? You know, the answer is yes. <laughs> because how does, what is a system other than people? How does a system change other than people changing the system? And how do you change the system? And this is a perfect place to end. How do you change the system? By using your voice to advocate for change at every single scale, because wherever you are, you are the perfect person to talk about it. So I want to close with one story. And it is this. I, my TED Talk was released in December 2018. And in May, I was doing one of my bundles. I was over in the UK. And it was the last event of the day. I've been going since first thing in the morning and I just finished a lecture at the London School of Economics and I was tired. Believe me, I do get very tired. <laughs> and I was walking back up the aisle and I was just you know, thinking about, I was gonna put my, my feet up and get a nice cup of tea. And I saw a man standing right there. And he was obviously waiting to speak with me. So I stopped and he introduced himself and he said, I watched your TED talk. I was like, oh, that's great. Because you know, your TED talk just comes out and you don't know who's watching it. And he said, and I've been working a lot in my, he lived in a suburb of London called Wandsworth, a couple hundred thousand people. He said, I've been advocating for climate action forever and nothing's been happening. I've just been banging my head against the wall. I saw your TED talk and I realized, why don't I just try having conversations about it? I mean, what do I have to lose? So he said, I started to have conversations and now I have a list of all the people I've talked to in the town where I live, plus all the people they've talked to, plus all the people they've talked to, would you like to see my list? I said, well, that's a new one. Sure. <laughs> so he reached in his bag and he pulled out a list and I was expecting, you know, what, 75, 80 names. I mean, it'd been like five months, right? He pulled out 10,000 names. They had had 10,000 conversations in five months in the borough of Wandsworth. And he said, as a result, the city council just voted to declare a climate emergency. And then the next year, they voted to put 20 million pounds, which for a small town is a lot of money, towards a climate resilience plan. And then he just sent me a message on, um, on Twitter the other day, like two weeks ago. The city itself now has a talking climate program where if you go to the city's website, they have a talking climate program where they're bringing together citizens of the city to talk about how they can build resilience to climate impacts and how they can reduce their use of fossil fuels together. And how did that all happen? One man, one man. He was not you know, a big property owner. He was not a member of the city council. He was not a influential, important, wealthy person, a very ordinary person having those conversations. And he's changed his entire town. So if he could do it, I think we could do it. Thank you.